going all the way from Amsterdam today. So put your hands together for this guy who's going all the way from Amsterdam to speak at our meetup. Cheers, come on. Thank you, thank you for this lovely introduction. Yes, I flew all the way because uh, if there was a road I would have driven over here, it's not so far. It's only a 45 minute flight. Thank you for uh, being here uh, at this Risk Class Meetup. And this is a strange meetup for me because I'm a conversion rate optimization specialist. I'm not a designer. I'm, I'm not a UX guy. Well, maybe not really true because user experience also has to do with conversion optimization. So it's discussion which is part of what. Um, but it's fun to be here as an optimizer, and because I'm an optimizer, and if you run out to the toilet during my talk, which is pretty fine of course, then it will only take you one or two minutes if you grab one of these badges on the way out, because then you can enter again. If you don't grab them, it's going to take you 25 minutes and miss lots of my talk. So that's the first optimization tip. Um, the slide deck I collected is uh, a bunch of stories. It's a, a bunch of stories for the last uh, nine years since I've been uh, working in optimization. And it, it starts with more focus on conversion optimization and what we do. And it moves slowly forward to design, design sprints, and how to uh, be ethical in companies, and uh, how the brain functions. And it all ends with a uh, potential solution which we are still working on, but I think that's a great start of a potential discussion for the panel later on. So a bunch of stories, bear with me. If you have any questions, just feel free to ask. If I think it's slowing down too much, I will keep them and, and, and do it at the end, because we have some time for Q&A, uh, but then probably the pizzas will be arriving, so uh, I'll be around for lots of questions. Since 2009, uh, the company I'm running is Online Dialogue, based in the Netherlands, with 25 people, doing evidence-based growth. And that means we are combining data science and uh, psychology, consumer psychology. And those two combines are used to optimize mostly revenues from companies. And we're part of the Global Optimization Group, which is a large network of all these kind of organizations doing optimization throughout the world. And we have all these lovely clients, which is amazing. And what we always try to do at those clients is this. This is what Jeff's saying, and if you ever go to a conversion optimization conference, you will see quotes of Jeff everywhere. But he said our success at Amazon is a function of how many experiments we run per year, per month, per week, and per day. Fascinating. This is what we are trying to learn our clients. And he's not by himself. Uh, if you look at the Google Stadium or Facebook or Microsoft, and what Mark's proud of, uh, one of the things I'm most proud of, and think what is the key to our success, is this testing framework we've built. Microsoft, instead of saying, I have an ID, what if you said, I have a new hypothesis? Let's go test this. So that's what we're doing. Now, what we really believe in is validation in every organization. Validate your assumptions. But first, a story about this little thing in your head, which is called the brain. It's a fascinating little machine. Now, if you're into biology and, and, and understand a bit how the brain functions, it's, it's way more complex than the computers we have nowadays. It's a really fascinating machine. And along the years, we have learned from consumer psychology that we have a dual processing brain. Uh, most psychologists agree, and most scientists agree that we have two systems. And nowadays, these are called system one and system two. Really boring. It's Daniel Kahneman that came up with this. And system one is like the old system that has always been there in your head. It's like the subconscious, emotional processes. And a recent add-on is system two, which is the conscious part of your brain, uh, rational thinking. And so we have two of these systems in our brain. And the fascinating stuff about these systems is that they really control how you behave. And we all think we are rational human beings, but we're not. Yeah. Meet your own system one. System one is the subconscious system. Yeah? If I give you this one, two plus two is? There you go. That's like an automated answer. No one was calculating this. Yeah? You know two plus two is four. That's your system one answering the question. If I take this one, 17 by 24. 
Who knows the answer? Can you feel your brain taking energy, calculating this? It's four or something. There you go, four and eight. That's system two answering this question, because you did not automate this answer. You have to think really hard. So ratio is kicking in, and your system two is taking over, and it's going to do the math. And this takes energy, lots and lots of energy. Another example. If I would read out the words, that's quite easy, like yellow, blue, orange, black, red, green, purple, yellow, red. That's my system one. Uh, we automated reading. But if I take my system two, and I have to name the color of the words, it will go like uh, green, red, blue, blue, yeah, come on. <laughs> that's way slower. Now, of course, there's a magic trick. You have to start reading from this side, so you can name the colors. But this is this is taking mental energy. You have to you have to overrule the automated answer and think of the color and then name the color. That's hard to do. So that's your system one fighting, your system two fighting system one. Your ratio is fighting your automated answer. Take a look at cross. And if you keep your eyes on this cross, while the faces start uh, switching around you will see something strange happening if you look at the cross. And if you look at the cross, you see something strange happening, then look again at the faces. And you see pretty regular faces. But if you look in the middle, they seem grotesque and strange. That's weird. That's strange, isn't it? And because you look in the middle, you see something happening on the, on the edges, and your brain doesn't really know what's going on, so it's mixing up stuff. So you're seeing something that's not there. And your brain is making up stuff for you. That's fascinating. And the characteristics of system two, and your rational system. Another example. If I would tell you that I have one son, this one, but I also tell you I have two kids, what are the chances of the other kids also being a son? Zero to percent. Most common answer, 50%, because uh, boy girl is like almost 50-50. Which is not true. Uh, the chances of the other one being a boy too is only one third. Uh, and uh, if you know this is quite simple math, but still if you listen to the answer, you probably keep on thinking, oh, this can't be true. In the beginning there are four options. I have two boys, I have two girls, a girl and a boy, or a boy and a girl. But I already gave you one answer. Yeah. Two girls is no longer an option. You know there's one boy. So from all the options left, there is two boys, boy girl, girl boy. So a two third chance of the other one being a girl. Now only one third being a boy. This is like way too hard to process, so your brain just comes up with the easy answer. It's 50%. Take a look at this example. This is a Dutch hotel website. It's the Amsterdam Airport Hotel. And on the left one, we have the default website. And what we learned along the way, uh, running surveys on the website, and you have to survey the light box pop up, asking some questions. We always measure stuff, so we run A B experiments on the survey. So some people were invited to the survey, and some people were not invited to the survey. And we learned that the people that were invited to the survey had a higher conversion rate, and it didn't really matter if they answered the survey or did not answer the survey. So the fact that we showed a survey pop up, of more conversions. So then what we tried is just open up a pop-up which doesn't make sense. So if you enter the website, this little thing opens up. It's just an image of, of the same, same background with a button which is saying go to the website. So people click it and then we measured that this one has a way higher conversion rate. And this is also logical psychological knowledge. Um, if, if your brain starts thinking, oh, um, I seem to be someone that clicks on this website, so I just continue clicking. It's like going to the Apple store where all these apples are open like this. They even have a tool to measure this, mostly their iPhone. So once you approach the machine, you first have to touch it before you can it. It really makes you love the machine way more. And this one gave an inter interesting discussion, because is this an ethical thing to do? Right? Should we well, mislead users a bit without them knowing that they're going to buy more? So 
So we did not implement this one in the live websites. The hotel, hotel chain was not happy with having something like this on their website. This was not part of how they would see their brands and how they would treat their, their customers. But an interesting case, the labor law effect. You probably know this one. It's the monkey business illusion. Oh, hang on. I need sound. The monkey business illusion. Count how many times the players wearing white pass the ball. So if, if you know it, go with me. How many times white? One, two, three, and go on. Correct answer is 16 passes. So, who had seen this one before? Okay, were you able to count the number of passes? Or did you stop counting when the gorilla showed up? Yeah. <laughs> you stopped counting. And did you notice the fact that the curtain changed color? And one of the players from the black team was leaving the scene? If you've seen it before, the fun thing is the task is count. If you never have seen this before, you're going to count, you probably won't see the gorilla, won't see the gorilla chasing, but if you have seen it before, you stop counting because you're not touch the gorilla. That's fascinating. System 2 needs focus. And once you're doing a tough task, you need to focus, and everyone, everything else blurs out. And this is what we have to deal with as users. Our users using our mobile websites. And there's lots of competition going on. They need to pay attention to the app or the mobile site or whatever they're using while being in traffic. So system 2 is only dealing with the fact that it doesn't want to be killed. And system 1 is using probably WhatsApp or Facebook Messenger or so on. But that's a tough one. So system 2, your ratio, prefers to be absent and it needs focus. It needs lots of energy. And you probably won't have enough energy to use system 2 throughout the day. Which is fascinating if you look at conversion rates on your website in the morning, in the afternoon, or in the evening. But that's system two. Then we have system one. And system one is automated. And automated behavior is fascinating. Little change on the same Amsterdam Airport Hotel website. This is the default. And this one only has added this visual queuing. And what we measured is how many people scroll down all the way to the bottom of the page. And all I just find is this difference. Uh, in the, you know, they switch around, but in the new one, 25% of the people scroll all the way down, and in the original one, only 5%. So just adding visual queuing, automated behavior that they scroll all the way down. Really easy, automated behavior. It's also really associative. And to give you an example, uh, some, uh, 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 example of, of this is that we have run, been running lots of experiments on hostile worlds, which is based here in the UK. And what we knew is that safety is a really important issue. And if people want to book a hostel, uh, they want to know that they're safe because they're going to stay in a dorm with eight people, 12 people, 16 people in a strange country, in a city they don't know. Uh, mostly young people that will get drunk and if they go to Amsterdam, they're going to do all sorts of drugs. They want to be safe. So what we started doing, because we have all these ratings and measurements from all these hostels, we just started saying that, well, this is a really safe hostel. But once we mentioned safe, the conversions went down, not only for that specific hostel, for the whole website. So people left and didn't book a hostel. They probably went to Airbnb or book a hotel or whatsoever. So if we mention safe, conversions go down. It's like asking for your email address and saying, we're not going to spam you. It probably lowers conversions because there's something no spam. So what we did is had this score over here, cleanliness. So we know from these hostels, uh, some are really clean, they have 24-7 reception, um, all sorts of uh, associations that will implicitly make you think of safe. And once we started adding those scores to the ones that are indeed safe, the conversions for those hostels went up. This is all system one behavior. 
system one without having system two in place. So the main characteristics of system one is automated heuristics and associative. To give you a final example about the brain of system one and system two, I have the marshmallow test. This is a fascinating test if you have kids, especially in the age of like four or five years old. And we did a test on the kids from my business partner. Um, so two of them, also a friend from the neighborhood. And the task is, okay, you will get this marshmallow. You can eat it now, or I'll come back in a couple of minutes, and I'll give you another one if it's still there. So it's pretty simple. You eat it now, only have one, wait a couple of minutes, and you have two. Twice the fun. So let's see what happens. Here's one, another one. Yeah. The plates are not dirty, it's like a typical Dutch print on the plate. Got three kids, and the first one, yeah, there he goes. <laughs> the other two are older, like, what are you doing? Yeah, hmm, I like this one. <laughs> when is the next one coming up? Let's see what I can do. I want another one. Maybe I can take this one too. Nope. Uh, and the fun thing is, this test is the best prediction for the future life, happiness, and wealth, and well-being of your child. If they can't pass it by like the age of five, they're going to have a trouble controlling their system one instincts. <laughs> so this is a really fascinating test. Here you see system one saying, okay, I'll eat it now. And when they're old enough, they are able to control it. And the fun thing is, if you do this in the morning or in the evening, if you do it in the evening, way more kids just eat the marshmallow. Because their system 2 is depleted, so they can't control it anymore. So, why do we think we are in control of what we do? Because the inconvenient truth is the fact that we hardly have a free will. We hardly have one. Yeah? And I think the best example is this experiment from science. This is a split brain patient. And it's a bit hard to understand, but split brain means there's no connection between the left brain and right brain. And they did an experiment on this person, and what they do, they show them a picture, pretty fast, like this. And then they ask them, okay, pick pictures that you think are good based on the thing you saw. So what he sees is, okay, a chicken foot, and that's projected to the left side of the brain to the right eye, left of the brain, and it controls the right hand, and it picks the chicken head. Makes proper sense. Uh, but there's no connection between left and right. So what this person sees over here is physically in the brain, but not translated to this part where all the processing takes place. So it sees the, 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 the snow-covered lane, uh, and, the, and the, indeed the left hand, and it's from the first again, picks a shuffle. But the really interesting thing comes up when you ask this person, why did you pick? Well, this one I picked because of the chicken food. And this one I picked because I need to clean out the chicken skeptics. So it comes up with a reason. It's post decision rationalization. It doesn't know it has seen this one. It has seen it unconsciously. It was not able to understand why it picked this one, so it comes up with a reason post decision rationalizing. And this is what happens to most of the people that buy something online. They just need an alibi after they bought. So they make the decision first, then they need an alibi. And that's fascinating. You know, hardly any free will. Users don't know what they do. And especially don't know why they do it. So there's a gap between system one and system two behavior. So what we have been doing in design along the years, going from like this old website to this New, pretty-looking, big redesign for mobile and tablet and desktop. Long projects, lots of user testing. Of course, user testing is really good to observe and to find all these usability bottlenecks in there. But if you start asking people why they did something, they don't know. They just come up with a reason. They just come up with a reason. And this is, to me, the reason why you should run experiments. And running online experiments Having the users on the website, split them into controls and challenge you 50-50, measure for quite a while, and then look at the outcome. That's the only way how you will know if something has an impact or not. Because the users can't explain it to you. 
And this is how CRO starts. I think mostly now, nine, eight, nine years ago, when Optimize the Infinity made a B testing easier. And we all started with this one person, one goal, ROI, lift ROI. We call it the MacGyver approach. Uh, this person needs to understand analytics, design, front-end development, uh, make decisions, be a marketeer, and they started growing the business by running experiments. And to give you an example on what kind of experiments they were running, and this is again the Amsterdam Airport Hotel, the website did not look like this way back in uh, 2009. It looked like this. And this person analyzed, this, is, this is, isn't Dutch, the policies for that, but this is where you clicked on, I want to make a reservation, then it says, dear guests, booking has never been that simple. Uh, on this page you can fast, reliable, and 24-7 book a hotel room. And then they looked at the data and they found out, like, okay, there's a big dropout from this page, because they clicked on reservations, so clearly there's some intention, but they didn't go on to the next step. So this person, this MacGyver, thought, well, maybe I should add a button. And of course, they're not very good in, uh, in design, because they have to do anything. Uh, they created this big update button, button, probably in Paint or PowerPoint, added some USBs, and it says, book a hotel room. They added a call to action. And of course, this was a big win, which is like hooray for the business case, um, but probably uh, a proper expert review, or even a user test, or just anyone could have said, well, you're missing something over here. You know, why run, uh, why waste time running this experiment? But at least it adds value to the business. So this MacGyver person is really happy. Uh, one person doing everything, uh, A-B testing, more like a marketing baby, focus on earn fast money. And this one was value, but most of those experiments are not that, that high value, and no understanding of customer behavior. So moving up, because this person proved the fact that he could earn money, uh, companies started creating an optimization team. Uh, they're like four or five full time, of course, it's scaled from two persons, three persons, four persons. Uh, but this is a team of a, uh, a UX designer, front end developer, copywriter, data analyst, project leads, maybe some behavioral scientist. And they started running optimization. That's what we call the A team approach. Uh, and the A team approach is more like okay, for every experiment, we, we have to find. Uh, there must be a reason to do something, we're going to analyze what's going on, we're going to create something, test it, analyze it, conclude or combine results and tell everyone in the company what kind of money we made. So they went up from paid testing to hypothesis testing. Uh, and hypothesis testing is, is adding behavioral science to your experiments. Uh, this is the website way back in 2012, and it, it, it has this list of USPs, and this was already an experiment. They found out by adding green check marks that conversions went up because people will get the feeling like it's good, you did something good, yes, good, good. They didn't really matter what was held over here. But then the behavioral scientist said, well, maybe we need to change this because this is quite hard to process. And uh, we, we switched them around and didn't really make an impact on conversions, so maybe we should layer them and say this one is pretty important, and then we have this one too, and also we have this, this, and this. So even without being able to read the content, this already probably feels a bit more like a present than this one. Uh, and more attention also, and more time spent. The fun thing is, uh, to find out which one should be on top, they run surveys and ask people what they thought was the most important one to be on top there. And most people said, okay, free cancellation 24 hours before check-in, that's the most important reason for me to look at this website. So they run experiments, and while running experiments, they found out that this is not the most important one. This is the most important one. Lowest price guarantee. So what people said and how people acted online, there was a difference. But this one was working way better, and it, again, had more conversions. But then it goes on. They went up from page optimization to hypothesis, which is still page-based, to customer journey optimization. And if you are in UX for quite a while, you probably will say, well, that's what we've been doing for 20 years already. How come these optimization people don't know they have a customer journey? It all has to do with, with maturity. Uh, we're growing up, uh, but now we know there is a customer journey. And what we found out is that this is like the biggest landing page, and half of the users will click something in the navigation bar, and the other half is using the booking widget over here to check availability of rooms on a specific date for a specific number of people. 
And we knew from research that uh, there are lots of people that first go to Booking.com or some Expedia brand. They will find the right hotel. If they find the right one, the right one, they will copy the name, paste it in Google, hit enter, and then uh, the original brand site comes up on AdWords and on organic. They click it. They will use this budget to check the price. If the price is right, they will continue. If it's higher, they leave out. And this is what we do because of studies uh, and user testing and giving people a broader uh, assignment than just looking at this website. Just, just go book, find a hotel and, and book a room. So half is using this, half is using this. And we had the feeling that people that were price comparing were, were using this one. So we added a survey. The survey popped up immediately after you use the booking widget or after you use one of the navigation elements. And it's asking two questions. Did you already decide which hotel you want to stay in? And are you currently comparing the price of the rooms in this hotel or the website? <laughs> and of course, people lie. So you're not sure if the yes or no answers are really true, but these are quite simple questions. Yes or no questions, submit these answers. And when we compared the answers with behavior on the website, we found out that people using these widgets, 65 to 70 percent is price comparing. And if they use the navigation, only 30% is price comparing. So that's interesting. Because with this knowledge, we were able to reanalyze a bunch of A-B experiments we run on the booking funnel. Because we have this terrific white space over here, and we use it a lot to embed USPs and all sorts of testimonials to see if it had an effect on conversions. It was all, always inconclusive. Hardly any significant uplifts. And we once tested with switching the hotel rooms over here, so start with one with a higher price on top to see if the average order value would go up. But then we learned that conversions lowered a lot. So we knew that these prices were important. So now we were able to analyze, look at the results from the experiments for the people that take this route, and look at experiments on that specific page from the people that took this route. And then we found out that if you take the long route through navigation, that stuff over here didn't have an impact. And if you only take the price comparison routes, then all these short messages over here, made by the price, also made an impact. So we have two types of tasks, and especially two types of journeys. And this one did make an impact, but only on the price comparing people. So once we learned that, reanalyzing our experiments based on the survey data, we could do a bigger leap. What if we would change the home page to something like this? What if we would leave out navigation? If you're price comparing, you should be here. And if you want to explore some other stuff, you should be here. The fun thing is this one didn't really work out because like 85% of the users use this one. So we need to iterate that again. But we want to split those customer journeys because the way how to motivate people to take the next step is different for price comparing people and for people that are not price comparing, and stuff in the same way to take. But this is learning about user behavior while running experiments. And of course, this is based on what, what Deming created a long time ago in the quality circle. Plan, do, check, act. Toyota production system, lean, build, measure, learn. It's all the same approach. But what Deming also knew, that while running all these small experiments on the production line of the Toyota car factory, uh, because it's really expensive to rebuild or redesign the total production line of a car factory, he wants small experiments, and once he really knew what to do, he made some consolidation, a new standard. Lots of experiments, learning, 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 and then create a new standard. So he did do a, some sort of a redesign, but backed up with lots of data. And that became a new standard, and from there they started learning again. Quality improvement. So what's happening with the team? The team is moving from this, this like waterfall approach of running experiments, Tomorrow set up like this. Yeah. Doing studies on the whole customer journey, really finding out what's going on. Yeah. Combination of user testing, interviews, data studies, form experiments, scientific knowledge that's being published on specific, specific behavior for your niche. And then they start formulating hypotheses. And then they're going to run experiments on these hypotheses to see if these hypotheses are true or not. And once they learn the hypothesis is true or not, they're going to add this knowledge to the customer journey. So it goes something like this, like rapid experiments, speeding up, speeding up, learning about these hypotheses, and then learning about the customer journey. 
to give you an example selling beds and mattresses online, this is how the website used to look like. And then they started running experiments. And this one was the one with a really big impact. I think I have a translation. Oh, no, I don't have a translation. It's a statement saying, uh, did you know that the average human being sleeps eight hours, eight hours per night? And uh, uh, this bed takes 10 years before you get a new one. So for a perfect night rest, you only pay for this bed per month 82 cents. It's mental accounting. And now you can compare it to your phone bill. And this is a quite affordable bed, 99 euros. But think of one that will cost you like 2,000 euros or 2,000 British pounds. Then it's only like 20 times higher, so only 16 pounds per month. So compared to your phone bill, eight hours per night, well, that's, that's quite an interesting price. So we add this, and then it went on with, okay, we should mention the brand if it's a real good, famous brand, and we have this USB over here, which also made a difference on conversion rate. And um, if we have something to give away for free, we should attach it to the image of the bed, so it gets emotional value. Uh, we should add this one, which says, okay, you can pay, save, pay, uh, pay safely through the website, or when it's delivered at your home. So all these optimizations made the website look like this, which our user designers call a visual nightmare, uh, or just a copy of Booking.com. <laughs> For that's not. But it's working. Higher conversions. Uh, but then, of course, the next step is to create something like this: a new beginning, a new standard, better visual layout. It's more at ease. It takes less brain power to process. And the interesting question is, this one could even be depleting your system too. So you're not able to make a rational decision anymore and just buy the bed. And this one, or you need less energy to process it. The good thing was, conversion went up with this one too. So there's some faith in humanity. But this is how we optimize. Yeah, and take the next step. And the fun thing is, of course, we went from this one to this one. That's something that could have been done by a couple of design sprints too, with the proper design team. And that, that, that's the thing, especially where the optimization team kept bumping in. Yeah, the optimization team, uh, some structures process, bumpy, some focus on business case, uh, but especially technical interference with product teams. Uh, the company has meanwhile changed and to, to some, something like this, like the value chain tribe setup with squad owners or product owners for specific value chains and specific chapters in there, uh, all, all being fast and agile and optimizing. And they're responsible for a specific part of the website, like selling expensive beds from a specific brand on this website. And these redesign things are interfering, and these experiments are interfering with what they do. So. Uh, the, the company changed, yeah, and most companies changed. You know, well, optimization is about effectiveness and getting more results out of the things you are doing. Uh, most of these organizations, especially the IT departments, they started adopting Lean and uh, Six Sigma and uh, Agile and Scrum and you know, doing sprints. And these are all popular methods to improve efficiency, getting things done and lowering the cost of production, which is a good thing. You know, we're finally able to get things done way faster. The best thing would be if we were able to combine it. Efficiency and effectiveness. Getting the right things done. Maximizing production success. So, for most companies, the next step after the conversion optimization team, the centralized team, is like the army approach. We should have all product teams running optimization. They should all optimize based on data, run experiments. And they should all apply an approach like this and doing all these experiments and learn from hypothesis and so on, learning about the customer journey. But it doesn't work. It doesn't work. And the optimization lighthouse is still there, the centralized team, to support those product teams with statistical knowledge. Uh, it's hard to run experiments, uh, specific technical knowledge. Uh, but it gave scant focus at the product teams. They're losing page. To run a good experiment, you need like six weeks from start to end. That's quite fast. While these sprints are like two weeks or one week. It doesn't make sense. They don't have the time to run these experiments. That's conflicting trials, optimization program versus roadmap of these product teams. 
And most of these teams are focusing on earn money now. And of course, the optimization team also costs money, so they're also focusing on earn money now. Well, they should focus on understanding the customer needs, but you don't have time to focus on understanding customer needs. So the solution we came up with last year, which we're now implementing at some clients, is a validation lab. So going from a guy for to a team, not going to the army approach, <coughs> but take a different route for the A team. The A team becomes a validation lab. They really work with proper hypothesis. If I apply this, then this behavior change will happen among this group because of this reason. So there are behavior experts in there, there are data scientists in there, and they work with the customer journey from all the products that are in there. So the centralized optimization team becomes bigger, moves up to like 15 people, 20 people. And they really learn about specific system one and system two behavior, what works on what specific part of the journey. And they do all sorts of studies and tests and experiments to understand what's going on. And they offer these detailed insights to the product teams. So if there's a specific product team for expensive beds, the validation lab will tell them, okay, this is what we know. So before you start running the sprint, this is what you should know. And this is what we learned along the way. And we have two setups now. The one setup is that the validation lab is centralized, where the knowledge is spread among the teams. They can just do and run their sprints, so without interfering. And the validation lab helps out along the way. The other setup is that there is a chapter of behavioral experts within every squad. So this is the squad of the product owners. So there's a behavioral specialist in every specific squad. And together, because they're a chapter, they are the foundation lab. So they do the long-term research and help out with their knowledge while doing the sprints in the product teams. I think that's a fascinating combination. And going forward to the topic of today, ethics, I think once you have a validation lab that does proper research, running proper experiments based on proper hypothesis, it's becoming a scientific approach. And if you go to science, if you go to universities, all these universities will have an ethics committee. And I, I took this one from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. The purpose of an ethical committee in referring by biomedical research is to contribute to safeguarding the dignity, rights, safety and well-being of all actual or potential research participants. And this is exactly what the foundation lab is doing. It's running experiments to understand how people behave, what the short-term impact is and what the long-term impact is. Because those users don't know what they do. They, they don't know what they're causing to their own long-term impact. But we can measure this. And once we can measure this, then we can ask an ethical committee if this affects something we want to cause, is this something that the company wants to cause among users? So we now have two clients that are indeed setting up an ethical committee with people from their own company, but also people from university that know about this kind of research. And once they're in the validation lab, especially the centralized one, once there's a question, should we do this kind of research? Should we implement this? Will it harm users, yes or no? We don't know. We just want to ask the ethical committee. And they will say yes or no, and then move on. And this is also why I think you need a foundation that's centralized. Because if this is part of all those product teams running sprints, you're just slowing them down. You're not getting things done anymore. They just need to speed up and deliver. But the big questions in there, those should be answered by the foundation lab and the ethical committee. Once you have a scientific approach like this, yeah. the real scientific method, as we all know, is make an observation, form a hypothesis, perform the experiment, analyze the data, report your findings, and then the next step is invite others to reproduce the results. Because only your finding is not meaning it's the truth. Once others also have the same finding, then you know it's the truth. And the power of companies on running experiments compared to what universities can do with studying behavior, running experiments in a lab environment with 100 psychological students, knowing they're part of an experiment, and the power of companies to learn from human behavior is way bigger. 
So please start sharing and make sure your experiments come on Google Schooler or Semantic Schooler or even the Spotify for scientific articles with deep dive. And the fun thing is that Facebook was doing this, publishing lots of studies they do, publishing lots of papers, but it backfired. It backfired with the article where people found out that Facebook tried to manip manipulate um, the way they show uh, the news in your timeline, like more positive news and comments or more negative news and comments, to see if your writings would become more positive or more negative. And there was a correlation between those, and they published it. And then the consumer said, well, this is really terrifying and scary, and I want to be part of that. So Facebook stopped publishing, but they're still running these experiments. <laughs> I think that's a big so please, if you start doing this, share your learnings because the consumer doesn't know why he's doing something and doesn't know the long-term impacts. And I think together we can uh, bridge this gap and uh, become more ethical. So that's why I think running experiments, yeah, it could be unethical, you could run into these experiments where you show this pop-up that doesn't make sense, and then people click on it and buy more. I think that's an unethical approach. But it's even more ethical to me not to experiment. Thank you.